Released in 2011 as a light novel in Japan, Danganronpa Zero would be the prequel tale for events leading up to the first game. Written by series creator Kazutaka Kodaka, the story details events of Hope's Peak Academy and the central figures to the incident within, one month after it happened. The story only gets larger from here, so let's cut it down to size with a recapitation. As the story begins, we're introduced to Hope's Peak Private School, where all of society's prodigies and very best of their fields are scouted and developed in this academy, said to be the hope of humanity's future. However, a malicious student named Junko Enoshima has succeeded in manipulating the respected student council into murdering each other in a mutual killing game, and incited unrest among the remaining students, all for the self-entertaining purpose of shattering hope and dragging it down into despair. It's been one month since this tragedy of Hope's Peak, called The Incident, and the headmaster Jin Kirigiri is addressing the entire faculty on what the action will be going forward. He explains that the school must persevere as a symbol of hope for the world, and continue the research of talent, and this incident cannot endanger that. He reveals it is the decision of the steering committee, the four people in charge of the school, to cover up this incident, and continue on their march of progress, and the entire faculty unanimously agrees. We're now introduced to a girl named Ryoko, an amnesiac who still carries the prestige of Ultimate Analyst even if she cannot remember why. She keeps a notebook with her at all times to remind her of acute observations, people she knows, what she's doing and what she's going to do, as she also experiences short-term memory loss as well. Still, she remains cheerful, as she goes to a regular session with her childhood friend and one-sided crush, Yasuke, the Ultimate Neurologist. As she enters his office, he throws a blade near her head, startling her, and then immediately changes the subject from that to her looks, and then to the manga he's reading. He then goes back and asks her her own name, and she replies accurately, though not confidently. However, when she brings up the knife he initially threw at her, he stands to attention, wondering how she recalled that event, as her short-term memory loss usually would have forgotten that by now. She wonders if she's simply getting better, but Yasuke openly ponders if she's actually getting worse. Still, she's cheerful and overbearing in her attempts to appeal to Yasuke, who regards her only as a research subject. As he guides her through her session, he explains progressing research on brain functionality and memory, but also talks of the protesters outside called a parade, made up of the reserve students. As Hope's Peak is mainly used for research for talent, all of the funds for that research mainly comes from exploiting a branch of average students called the Reserve Department, who are allowed to attend and benefit from the school's name in exchange for outrageous tuition. Tired of being used only for their money, and incited by Junko and Ashima during the tragedy a month ago, they now protest daily. As they move to the sleep portion of their experiment, Yasuke leaves and Ryoko does her best to push out some of the hateful voices she's beginning to hear in her head. As she sleeps, Yasuke goes to answer Headmaster Jin's summons, as he is invited to sit in and talk with the four old men in black suits called the Steering Committee. Yasuke is uncomfortable in their presence, as they have had him use his talent to investigate the student who had first discovered the student council tragedy, and now they're asking him to investigate another student. He learns they still haven't learned anything of the true culprit behind the tragedy a month ago, but this student is an old lead they need to press, and they can only trust Yasuke with this task, not only for his talent, but also because he is the only student officially disclosed to know the cover-up attempt by the school. They reveal there were actually two survivors to the tragedy, one who was mutilated in the incident and survived, but has never recovered and is still in a coma. The other hid and was unhurt, but has now gone missing. Somehow, he is tasked with extracting information from the unconscious survivor, so he returns back to his lab and sends Ryoko away after their session. That night, Ryoko receives a letter from someone who stole her old memory notebook and demands she comes to a fountain location that night. When she arrives, she's shocked to find not only one of the steering committee members dead and hanging from the fountain with a rope around his neck, but also her notebook in a puddle of blood beneath the man. She dashes for Yasuke's room to alert him of what she found, and instead she runs into another boy in his room by the name of Yuto. Dashing back to the scene of the murder, she's shocked again as now the body is no longer there. Instead, she's introduced to the wickedly evil Jinko Enoshima, who is actually the one who called her out here. She confesses to being the one who hung the committee member, but is also puzzled as to what happened to the body as she didn't hide it. As Junko begins rambling on a confusing stream of consciousness, Ryoko turns to run, only to be met with Junko around every corner somehow, cutting off her escape. Junko explains there isn't any escaping from her as everything exists for her, and continues reveling in the death of a committee member who tried to cover up the incident. A dark and slender student named Ishiki now steps in, introducing himself and speaking to both girls, asking specifically for Junko, but now sees Ryoko and must bring her in for questioning too. As it turns out, Ishiki worked for the student council and is now investigating Junko to avenge the incident. Junko eagerly fights back and encourages Ryoko to use her ability to do the same, but Ryoko can't remember what she's talking about. Junko kicks Ishiki away and flees, and Ryoko begins fleeing too, while checking her notebook and remembering her ability as the ultimate analyst. 
Ishigi now pursues Ryoko, and somehow fails to snatch her, as Ryoko keeps dodging at the last second as if she's able to perfectly predict things before they happen. In fact, with her super analysis, she's able to trick him into a trap. But using his own talent as the ultimate bodyguard, another Ishiki is beyond, waiting to grab her and begins to choke her out for capture. As she loses consciousness, Ryoko sees Ishiki stop and pull back in pain with a broken arm, as Junko now sneaks up behind him and snaps his neck, killing him. Junko then introduces herself as the ultimate despair and runs away again, promising to see Ryoko later and secretly planning to target Yasuke next. The next thing she knows, Ryoko is tied to a bed and is being observed by Yasuke, who mentions this isn't the first time she's dipped into a manic state, as she's done so before when they were children. Ryoko can't remember any of it and instead brings up how she met Junko and also found the dead body. Yasuke is suddenly more interested in hearing her mention Junko than the murder, but Ryoko really can't help further. He now leaves her to go investigate the other student he was asked to look into, and leaves her to go back to sleep, still bound. When she wakes, she's been untied by Yuto, the boy she met earlier in Yasuke's room who's been here the whole time, just concealed thanks to his talent of being the ultimate secret agent. He says it's in his nature to solve problems and save people in trouble, and Ryoko decides to rely on him a little and reveal what she told Yasuke about Junko and the dead body. He says her name sounds familiar from a rumor involving an incident in the school that is still being investigated. He mentions that 14 people suddenly went missing last month, around the same time 14 students were somehow invited to study overseas, and finds that a little strange. However, Junko has disappeared since the incident, so that lead is unresolved too. He says it's too early to draw conclusions, but it seems so far Junko has deliberately chosen to involve her. He then claims to be on the case for her, but just like the super spies in the movie, he expects her to reward him with her body when he solves the case. Without getting her consent, he dashes off, and soon after, Yasuke comes back, wishing to speak more to her. Elsewhere, we now see Kyoko, daughter to the headmaster Jin, and member of the academy as the ultimate detective, waiting to meet a member of the steering committee in order to ask more questions, as she's been assigned to investigate the tragedy from a month ago. As soon as the member in question arrives, the moment he stops, a series of school desks suddenly drop from the school roof, crushing and killing the steering committee member instantly, and nearly crushing Kyoko too. She dashes up to the school roof, but by the time she arrives, the culprit is gone, and worse yet, the body of the victim has already been removed. We now see Junko again on the ground floor, annoyed that Kyoko is on her case, but also puzzled about the disappearance of the body. Kyoko then goes to meet with her father, sharing this encounter, and also wanting some facts verified. With her own investigation, she believes these deaths are in protest of the decision by the committee to cover up the incident, but perhaps more importantly, cover up the person who did it, Izuru Kamakura. Jin is impressed by her deductions and admits they're right, but declines still elaborating on either the incident or Izuru. However, he does admit his fear of this incident not ending with just the cover-up and extending beyond even the school, starting with the parade. Over with Yasuke, he goes to the hospital to meet with Soshun, the student council president that somehow survived the incident last month, though now lays comatose. Soshun remains unresponsive to all of Yasuke's questions, but when he mentions Junko, he catches Soshun twitch slightly. Now understanding what's going on, he asks Soshun how long he's actually been awake, only pretending to be non-responsive, and Soshun then reluctantly says, since the beginning. Still traumatized, Yasuke manages to extract that someone named Izuru is involved, but not very strongly. However, Junko seems to be the one behind things. Thinking about Junko triggers a violent reaction from Soshun, and Yasuke mentions to him that there's someone he's resolved to protect a long time ago. Preparing himself, Yasuke now strangles Soshun to death, silencing the loose end. The next day, Junko knocks on Ryoko's door and continues talking to her, revealing confusing revelations to Ryoko like she apparently has a lot to do with the incident even if she cannot remember that fact. She also says Junko herself serves two purposes. The first is to crush the school's hope, Izuru Kamakura. The second, as she brags to her, is to kill Ryoko's beloved Yasuke. Alarmed, Ryoko hurries over to Yasuke's lab now, intent on warning him, but instead all she finds is a different boy, Makoto, the protagonist from the first game, who's gifted with ultimate good luck. It turns out Makoto found Yasuke's student ID dropped on the ground and was simply returning it, and was just waiting for Yasuke to come back. However, they're interrupted as Ishiki now enters the room, claiming to be immortal after having been killed by his target before. Ishiki is intent on getting Ryoko to reveal what she knows of the incident, even threatening Makoto's life, but suddenly Makuru, Makoto's classmate with the talent of Ultimate Soldier, breaks in and knocks out Ishiki, luckily saving Makoto. Yuto is there, spying as always, but says he has business to speak about with Ryoko, leading her away and leaving Makuro to deal with Ishiki's unconscious body. Yuto then reveals so far, based on his spying around the school, he believes Izuru is behind the incident. But why Junko would want to crush Izuru and who Izuru actually is, is a mystery. There are no records of Izuru anywhere and not a single student knows of him, so he considers chasing a ghost a waste of time. 
and said if they pursue Junko, then they can solve for Izuru and crack the incident case. He believes Junko's relation to the case is that she must be the student who discovered the incident after it happened. Afterward, she was interrogated by the school, but has disappeared since. Suddenly, an epiphany hits him. Yuta now thinks that if they ask the interrogator about Junko, they'll get a clue. He heard they brought in a mystery student to lead the interrogation, running all sorts of neurological tests to ensure honesty, and it makes sense they would have asked the ultimate neurologist Yasuke to do this, hence his connection to all this. Now more of the puzzle seems clear, as Yasuke must know some secret to Junko for which Junko wants him dead, and Yuto leaves now to learn more. Later, Yasuke enters his lab and sees the mess of the scuffle from earlier, and more shockingly, Junko right before him. He asks her what she intends to do, and she explains she's not doing anything, because everyone is already doing what she expected for her, even Yasuke murdering Soshun. She taunts him with his past, of having an amnesiac mother who he wasn't able to save, and he always struggled with that, now seeing the same of his childhood friend Ryoko, hence why he does anything to protect her. He then asks where Izuru is, and she says that while she doesn't know, she does know where the people who know are, i.e. the steering committee, and thus finding Izuru is a matter of time. Suddenly, she kisses Yasuke, who oddly doesn't fight back, and as she pulls away, she reveals her lipstick has a paralyzing poison in them. Ryoko then wakes up in a strange, empty, prison-like room with only a highly decorated bed within. She's surprised to be waited on by a maid wearing a mask of a two-toned bear, and when asked, replies it is the face of something called Monokuma. She's introduced to a room beyond where there are a dozen more people, all wearing Monokuma masks, maintaining a secret society in the basement below the building housing the reserve students and teachers, where the regular staff never come. The maid also mentions they are preparing for their revolution, starting with crushing the perfect fantasy world Hope's Peak wishes to make built on the sacrifice and suffering of the reserve students, especially the ultimate Hope project they have created. She's shocked to see the students here watching videos of killing games recorded and depicting students killing each other for the sake of their own survival. In madness of it all, as well as seeing the other two steering committee members being mutilated and tortured, she feels faint and falls unconscious again. Waking up later, she's back in Yasuke's neurology lab, though this time being met by Kyoko, who's also here looking for Yasuke who has gone missing. As she inspects the lab, she casually drops as she suspects Yasuke to be involved in the murders of the two steering committee members, though perhaps not the actual killer, but is likely the actual killer of the student council president whose death was made to look like a suicide. To herself, Kyoko has found evidence already to implicate Yasuke's involvement with the dead steering committee members, likely as the person moving the body. However, with all four members missing, she wonders if Yasuke can lead her to the other two. Originally, she was looking into Yasuke because he is the prime suspect in the murder of the student council president, but new evidence she found in his lab proves a connection to the steering committee murders, but many questions now arise for why. She tries to corner Ryoko with some questions, but it's apparent Ryoko really doesn't know anything. Ishiki now bursts in, apparently undamaged from all his previous encounters, and touting his immortality, though Kyoko calls him out, and Ishiki Madurai reveals the truth through his trick. A twin emerges, and speaking in sync, it's revealed that they are two of the eight octuplet Madurai siblings, called the Ultimate Siblings, for their uncanny mutual understanding, resulting in them collectively being the Ultimate Bodyguard. A third sibling emerges to surround the girls, and even when Ryoko tries to escape out the window, two more Madurai siblings appear to cut her off. Suddenly, Makuro dashes in to take on the Madurai siblings, and in one fell swoop she takes out all four brothers before her. Ryoko now notices that everything is progressing conveniently along as per a plan, and deduces that despite them knowing, everyone involved is going along with that plan. She asks Makuro if she's involved with Junko in any way, and Makuro admits Junko is her sister, and reveals that since she was little has always been the ultimate despair, finding delight only in inflicting despair on others. As Ryoko begins to step away slowly, Makuro then reveals she knows where Yasuke is, but Yasuke killed the student council president, and when the Madurais find out, they will likely kill Yasuke. She offers an exchange. If Ryoko kills the unconscious Madurais here, then she'll be protecting Yasuke, and Makuro then will tell her where he is. Ryoko breaks down in refusal, and seeing this, Makuro gives her his location anyway, as she turns to kill the rest of the Madurai siblings. As rain begins to fall, Ryoko dashes to the abandoned school building Yasuke's in, and finds patrolmen around with Monokuma badges on that allow her through. She is approached by Yuto, who snuck in earlier after piecing together this building's involvement with all the other mysteries. First, he explains that the incident was the murder of all 13 members of the student council. Two people lived, however, the president and Izuru Kamakura, someone who Ryoko actually somehow remembers, which is very odd for her. Yuto continues his discoveries by explaining that Izuru is the ultimate hope the academy poured all of its resources into secretly making. Thus, when their prized hope caused this despairing incident, the academy chose instead to protect its interests and cover it up rather than reveal or expose Izuru. 
Junko was the first to learn of the incident and chose to leverage all of this in her endeavor to overthrow Hope's Peak. The deaths of the steering committee are definitely her doing in her effort to force from them the location of Izuru. He then leads her to where he believes they have Izuru hidden, eager to claim credit for saving the school's prized ultimate hope, and also believes they'll run into Yasuke along the way. The way he figures it, Junko is likely the mastermind behind the incident, not just the person who discovered it. However, she likely also had a helper, since Izuru is likely just the victim here. Ryoko suggests Junko's sister, Makuro, but Yuto believes Junko's helper is actually Yasuke. Hence, why Junko was able to avoid investigation after her interrogation by him. He also believes Yasuke helped Junko with the disappearance of the committee members' bodies, and as proof of their relationship, he witnessed himself when they were kissing, which Ryoko refuses to believe. As they stop in front of their destination, they enter a seemingly empty room. However, as they enter, Yuto soon slumps over instantly dead as his neck is quickly snapped. Out from the shadows steps out a man calming himself Izuru Kamakura, lamenting Yuto should not have been so meddling with Junko's affairs. Looking at Ryoko, he's surprised that she doesn't recognize him, but continues talking about Junko's plans of using the incident to overthrow the academy, and how brainwashing the reserve students into despair and experimenting with the mutual killing game with the student council was just the beginning. He then turns to Ryoko and confirms that she is remembering old details of the incident on her own, and forgetting other details, like Yasuke. As proof, the man claiming to be Izuru finally reveals himself to really be Yasuke, proving her memory is coming back and she's forgetting unnecessary details like him and her adoring love of him. She begs him to take her back and perform another session on her to restore her back to the way she was, but he says he can't do that, for neither of them can go back now. He realizes everything he's done to protect Junko has also been per setup and plan. He was the one who concealed her presence at first, he was the one who hid the bodies of the steering committee members, and he was the one who killed Soshun and Yuto for getting too close to the truth. When asked why he would go to those lanes, he explains it was because Junko offered to be there for him when he was alone as a kid, and has since been an important part of his life. At this time, Junko now enters the room and Ryoko calls her out, though Yasuke is confused on who Ryoko is talking to. Ryoko now looks closely, and as her memory is working better, realizes the girl she's now been dealing with, thinking to be Junko, has actually been her sister Makuro, simply dressed up as Junko this entire time. She explains the real Junko ordered her to look like this and say certain things to perpetuate her physically, as the real her was concealed but watching. Yasuke begins to despair now, lamenting how he loves Junko as much as he hates her, doing his best to remove her from everyone, and yet that still didn't matter. As these words sink in, and more memories now quickly return to Ryoko, a dark voice within her seems to come out, laughing now and talking out loud to herself. In an instant, it all becomes clear. The persona Ryoko never existed, and instead was a fake personality made to cover her real identity, Junko and Ashima. Smiling now, she takes out a knife and drives it into Yasuke, who while dying, still spits back he was at least able to prevent her from remembering for a little while. Smiling, Junko crushes him by revealing to him that the whole reason he had a terrible childhood from his mother suffering mysterious amnesia spells till her early death, and Junko creating a dependent friendship with him since children, was all her doing in the first place. Crushed by this last despair, Yasuke dies, his entire life completely invalidated. To herself, Junko actually admits she loved Yasuke sincerely and truly, and thus killing him in such an awful way was necessary, as she had to plunge herself deeper into despair. Now crying tears of delight from tasting even deeper despair, she mutilates Yasuke's corpse, now having successfully gained another skill necessary for her plan, Selective Amnesia. The next day, Kyoko wakes up from being knocked out during the fight with the Madarais, and her father Jin is there to welcome her. He explains Junko has recovered her memory, but claims to not be able to remember anything during her amnesiac period. She also mentions the Azuru case is being suddenly dropped, and new steering committee members are being inaugurated, and they see much more focus on secrecy. She asks then about Yasuke and the Madurai brothers, and Jin says the committee is claiming they were all expelled. Kyoko doesn't accept any of it, claiming she'll keep investigating on her own, and Jin says she is welcome to do so, but if she gets into trouble, he won't help her. As he turns to leave, he keeps to himself how the Izuru Kamakura project has been officially terminated, and this is the committee's way of walking away from it all. As the story ends, Junko prepares for her return to regular classes, still hanging on to the notebook in which she wrote down all of her notes about loving Yasuke, a necessary heartache to keep her in despair, and more importantly, all of the important memory manipulation processes he did to her, that she now intends to take and perfect on her own. With her experiments of brainwashing videos, the revolting reserve department, Yasuke's memory manipulation, Makuro's successful disguise of her, and the mutual killing game all being successes, all she needed now was a mascot for her next leap forward. For now, she is finally prepared to enact the next phase of her mastermind plan of complete global despair. 
Danganronpa Zero will continue into the first game. Danganronpa Trigger Happy Havoc. Thank you for listening.